Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, the Top 5 RPA Myths Dispelled. These are insights from our RPA Pinnacle Model Assessment. We hope everyone's doing great. We have a great hour ahead for everyone, so why don't we get started? First of all, let's uh, share some introductions for who's going to be presenting on today's call. We have... We have three, uh, two people that will be leading most of our discussions. First, we have Michael Jansen, who is our chief research guru. Michael is a co-founder of Everest Group Research Practice, and he's had a long and varied career in the global services industry. Michael, had, about a year ago, rejoined Everest Group after serving as both chief, chief research officer at MarketTrack and also Chief Research Officer at the Hackett Group. So welcome, Michael. We also have Sakshi Garg with us today. Sakshi is a practice director with our global sourcing practice and focuses on our enterprise and GIC research. She is the lead analyst on our RPA Pinnacle Study, and she has an in-depth understanding of RPA issues from an enterprise perspective. Also, you will have, um, we have Amardeep Modai who will be answering any questions. Amardeep is a practice director with Everest Group. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them in and we will do our best to answer them either online or at the end during our Q&A. So as you see, we have three very talented uh, people that will be leading our presentation. I will be your moderator today which is good that I am just moderating, as my claim to fame is I have seen every Harry Potter movie twice. So you are in good hands with both Michael and Sachse. Now, as we go on, let's talk about our discussion points for today. Uh, we're going to break our webinar into four key areas. First, we're going to talk about some of our differentiators for our RPA Pinnacle Enterprises. Most of you will know Everest Group through our peak matrices. That is when we take service providers and we give you the strengths and weaknesses and we rank them. The pinnacle model is something different and relatively new where we're looking at enterprise performance and how each enterprise compares to each other um, with their strengths and challenges. Next, we're gonna take the top five RPA myths and we're gonna use a very fact-based approach to dispel these myths associated with RPA in the market. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up talking about what this all means for enterprises. And then lastly, as you see, we're going to have a Q&A session that we'll lead. So any questions you have, please feel free to share with us. So why don't we get started? And I'm gonna ask Sakshi the first question, just to share with us a little bit. Sakshi, can you take us through the focus of today's discussion within the overall service delivery automation spectrum. Thanks, Alan. Um, our discussion today will be focused on RPA, RDA, and autonomic, which we will be collectively referring to as RPA. Our definition of RPA includes automation software that really interacts with the underlying systems through a user interface in the same manner as a human human does it. So really mimicking the human action uh, is what we are defining as RPA. Autonomics is, is, is similar and is commonly used to describe automation in the IT management scenarios. And collectively, RPA, RD, and Autonomics are going to be the focus of today's discussion, and we'll be calling them RPA throughout the discussion. Next slide, please. All right, so let me uh, explain the pinnacle model here and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so it's gonna take a little bit to kind of lay out all the elements here, but um, what, we're, what you see here is uh, each dot representing a steady participant. So uh, 52 participants, 52 dots. On the y-axis, we have created a set of uh, criteria for outcomes, outcome impacts, and we've broken those down between cost, operational impact, and business impact. Uh, those are aggregated to create a score, and then we've, uh, uh, plotted those on the, the y-axis for level one, two, and three. Along the x-axis, we talked about the, the capability required to get those outcomes. And so we looked at a number of dimensions you can see there. 
what we're trying to do uh, with the green elements of Pinnacle Enterprises, identify those enterprises that stand above both on capability and outcomes. And uh, we will be comparing uh, in the initial, initial set of slides, comparing those enterprises versus the rest in the, in the, in the space. What you'll notice here, if you look carefully, um, is a general tendency to move from the bottom left to the upper right in, uh, in the plot points. What you'll see is there are no dots or no enterprises in the upper left or bottom right. And the way to interpret that is, is if you want great outcomes, you've got to put in the capability. Or you can look at it from the other way and say, if you put in the capability, you're going to get some great outcomes. And so that cause and effect relationship is very much in play here. If you make the effort, you get some great outcomes. And so we're going to talk about some of those outcomes in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks, Michael. Let's look at the impact that clinical enterprises have been able to achieve and how that compares with other enterprises. And as Michael described, we, will go, we are going to look at it from, in three different ways cost impact, operational impact, and business impact. Talking about cost impact, um, you know, both Pinnacle Enterprises and other enterprises are seeing a 30% cost reduction in the areas where RPA has been applied. If we talk about the operational impact, uh, what we see is that Pinnacle Enterprises are achieving superior results in operational metrics such as process accuracy, process cycle time, staff productivity. Um, all the results for Pinnacle Enterprises are in green color, and those for other enterprises are in blue color. Uh, and you can see, if on an average, the performance improvement in operational metrics recorded by Pinnacle Enterprises is about 50%, whereas that uh, you know, recorded by other enterprises is 30%. So significant process uh, and operational improvements uh, happening due to our RPA uh, in all kinds of enterprises. So when I look at this, Sakshi, I look at this as a 30% improvement in cost uh, and a uh, significant improvement, either 30% or 50%. Any way you look at that, that's good news and great news. Uh, when I've done analyses in the past, you know, often you're having the conversation, well, here's the good news and here's the bad news. But when we, when we go through this, uh, the study results here, you're going to see virtually all of it's good news and great news. And, and Michael, uh, there is some bonus news as well, uh, which is uh, on the business impact side, uh, where some enterprises, especially the pinnacle enterprises, are already seeing improvement in customer experience. They are creating new business models using RPA. They've been able to decrease their time to market for certain products and services. So as you rightly pointed, this is a good news, great news, and a bonus news story from cost, operational impact, and business impact point of view. I think when we were talking to clients, I think both what you and I both heard was certainly the cost impact and operational impact is the primary driver right now, but we also heard people thinking about the overall business impact, and we expect to see a lot more of that going forward. Yeah, and as enterprises start adopting um, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive, and a higher you know, generation of automation technology, the impact on business impact, uh, business impact is even going to be, to be higher. Uh, that's what most enterprises are striving for. Okay, let's move to the next slide where we are going to talk about how are enterprises able to derive these superior outcomes, especially pinnacle enterprises, what is driving the success for them? Uh, and if you look at, uh, you know, vision and strategy, which basically means, um, you know, how well prepared were organizations that were embarking on the RPA journey, what we find, what we find found out was that pinnacle enterprises uh, Ninety percent of pinnacle enterprises were focusing on preparing their organization from a risk, security, process optimization perspective before implementing RPA. In fact, our analysis suggests that bro broken processes is the number two challenge that organizations are facing uh, you know, uh, when they are adopting RPA. And it seems uh, that pinnacle enterprises are definitely focusing on improving their processes before RPA is implemented. If you look at uh, you know, uh, the governance model, Pinnacle Enterprises have created a robust governance model and 100% or all the Pinnacle Enterprises have established an RPA COE and are, are encouraging sharing and pooling of resources across the organization. Pinnacle Enterprises are also ahead in terms of their RPA adoption. What that really means is they have four times higher scale of boards that they have deployed and they are 
faster in scaling up from pilot um, as compared to other enterprises by at least 25%, and their bot deployment speed is, to, uh, is at least three times faster than other enterprises. So, so accelerated RPA adoption is a key tenant of purpose enterprises. And finally, when we look at technology, they are focusing on developing uh, and sharing libraries of usable automations, methods uh, throughout the organization. And, and they're really thinking about this technology from a future standpoint, not really um, you know, a stopgap arrangement to solve their uh, problems associated with software. So this is an area you, know, you, you think of, look at the, these uh, just a few of the capabilities that we're highlighting here. Uh, the, the full study was almost 90 pages in the results, and we're just showing you a couple of the pages here to get this thing started today. Um, but there was a significant difference between the things that Pinnacle Enterprises were doing and those that uh, the rest of the enterprises were doing. So again, go back to the cause and effect. Um, if you put in the effort and you put in the, the, the pinnacle practices, if you will, that we that we measured, um, you were getting those results. Now I'll have se I will say this: um, this is still early days in uh, the journey for RPA. Um, we expect to see this get better. We expect to see adoption become more uh, a, a larger scale, and so uh, I expect the results to even or to see similar, but maybe even improved results. Um, in, in the next uh, year or two when we, when we repeat this study. But again, good news, great news, and even some bonus news here to talk about, and, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly worth the journey from what we can see. Great. So why don't we switch and ask a poll question now? We'd like everyone to participate. I know when everyone votes, it makes Michael very happy. So our question is, what level of growth are you expecting in your RPA efforts in 2018 compared with 2017? So we're going to switch the screen so you'll be able to vote right here. Please click, and the, the choices once again are no growth, about 26 to 100%. You're expecting 101% to 500% growth or even greater than 500% growth in your RPA efforts in this year compared to last year. If when you're measuring growth, vote, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, measuring, Michael. Yeah, when you're measuring growth, just think about it in the terms that are convenient to you. Uh, some people will be measuring the robotics, some people will be using process, but just look at it in terms of uh, the most common metrics that you, you're comfortable with and how much growth you expect in the, the upcoming year compared to last year. Great, so let's keep the poll open for another five seconds. And two, and one, and why don't we close the poll? And let's see what our results are. Survey says, survey says we're not gonna tell you. No, while, while we're switching that over, I, I would ask Sakshi, to talk a little bit about um, what you saw before you see what, what everyone on the, the webinar did, I would like to hear you think, share with what you saw from our assessment of market growth in 2018. Sakshi? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we have the poll results also available now. It is a um, little bit surprising, uh, but not you know completely surprising because our study suggests that RPA market is expected to grow uh, with a three-digit growth rate and is expected to become a huge 10 to 12 billion dollar market by 2019. Uh, I see that only 33 percent of the of the respondents um, have responded in the, in the same uh, same range and a whopping 55% are in 26 to 100% category. Uh, seems like we have some attendees or participants which are probably in the initial uh, days of their RPA program and are still exploring, experimenting, uh, and maybe as they mature their RPA programs, uh, they will realize the true, true potential of RPA. Uh, but our analysis suggests that the market is expected to grow with a three-digit growth rate uh, in the next uh, couple of years. Excellent. 
Okay, thank you, Sakshi. So now let's go to the second part, part of our webinar today. Um, <clears throat> there was a popular show here in the United States called Mythbusters, uh, where they would take myths and prove whether they were true or, or false. Well, in essence, that's what we've done today. We've taken the five main RPA myths and we've taken our research and from a fact-based approach, we're going to dispel these myths. So why don't we start off with the first myth. And our first myth that I'm sure we've all heard and thought about, but the first myth is that robots will replace humans. So Sakshi, tell us, tell us how you respond to that myth. Sure, Alan. Uh, the reality is that enterprises are focusing on reskilling and upskilling of resources rather than layoffs uh, for the resources that are getting impacted by RPA. And we'll prove that with some of the data that we collected as part of the Pinnacle study. So if you move to the next slide, uh, we'll see an assessment um, where uh, we're talking about how did organizations manage the you know, impacted resources which were impacted by RPA. And the green bar is obviously the Pinnacle Enterprises, blue is the other enterprises. And, and what you see here is 98% of the impacted employees for the Pinnacle Enterprises were either reskilled, upskilled, or redeployed. And only 2% uh, were laid off. In case of other enterprises, also, you know, 83% employees were reskilled, upskilled, or redeployed. At an overall level, in our, in our study, only 11% employees were laid off, whereas about 89% were reskilled, upskilled, or redeployed, which clearly suggests that there is a significant focus on talent management uh, and reskilling, upskilling, and it has become an imperative for organizations. We don't deny the fact that some jobs, uh, job cuts will happen and there will be some impact on jobs. But uh, we believe it is not going to be uh, in the same, uh, you know, of the same magnitude as is reported in the media. Uh, Michael, would you like to comment on the impact of RPA from a labor pyramid perspective? Yeah, so it's actually, you know, consistent with what we saw here, uh, very little impact in the middle layers of the labor pyramid on the next slide. And so if you think about a traditional labor pyramid where you have you know, very few at the top and lots of uh, uh, work, transactional workers in whatever industry you're in uh, as they apply at the bottom. What, we, what we're what we basically seeing right now is uh, almost no layoffs in the early uh, applications of RPA. Now, part of that, what's going on there is, first of all, we have a labor shortage in that middle layer in the U.S. and, uh, and Europe. So right now, unemployment being at its all-time low, what folks are looking to do is say, hey, if we can free up uh, portions of jobs or even hold jobs, we're going to keep those people because we, we can't afford to let them go from the organization. We'll just redeploy them in other roles. Now, we do think over the long term that the transactional workers will take a hit. Now, where that's going to be is probably going to be largely in the low-cost locations. So if you think about what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years, Many of the transactional workers were uh, impacted by labor arbitrage into those low-cost locations, and we think that if there's going to be an impact, it will be there, and quite likely there will be an impact there. Um, but again, in that middle layer uh, for the U U.S. and Europe, I think there's going to be a strong um, effort to make sure that whatever the um, initiatives that create RPA, they're not going to be branded as RPA. They're going to be branded as how do I help the employee experience? How do I help the customer experience? How do I get more productivity out of my current uh, team that I have right now? So as uh, if I can't, can't hire them in the marketplace, at least I, I can still continue to get uh, productivity improvements or even top-line growth by getting more out of my existing workforce. Great. Okay, so why don't we go to the next slide, and we're going to have another poll question. So everyone get, get your voting fingers ready. Now we've talked about, you know, we've tried to dispel the myth that uh, robots are, are not going to replace humans, but we realize there has to be some change. So which of the following talent upskilling, reskilling approach 
have you found to be the most effective? And if we will switch, and you can see the choices are, is it job rotation or special projects? Is it learning on the job? Is it coaching and mentoring by experienced employees? Peer-to-peer -peer learning or work shadowing? Or training programs offered by third-party trainers? Which of those options of, of talent upskilling, reskilling, have you found to be the most effective? And if you could all vote and then submit your vote. We'll give, keep the polls open for a few seconds here. Um, but we think this is very important, especially off of the last myth that we talked about, to give people an idea of what do we do in terms of the, the change of the market and the, the rotation to digital. Um, so we'll keep the poll open for about five more seconds. Get your last votes in. We promise there's been no Facebook meddling in this voting. Uh, three, two, one. Why don't we close the poll? And as we get ready for that, um, once again, we want to point out that these five uh, choices here are all things that companies are doing. Um, and we're going to share with you what, what our research suggests. So you can see it's pretty even among the top three there. So. Sakshi, tell us, based on our research, what do we see from, uh, from that perspective? Sure, Alan. I think uh, our, our study also suggests that uh, some of the more experiential-based, um, you know, uh, upskilling, reskilling programs, which could be job rotation, learning on the job, are more effective for upskilling, reskilling of talent rather than classroom-based programs, which is what uh, looks like, um, you know, the, survey, the, the, the poll participants are also seem to be suggesting. Excellent. Well, thank you. Well, it's time for myth number two now. So our second myth is that RPA is applicable in only few industry verticals and functions. Well, the reality is that uh, RPA use cases are already available across industry verticals and functions, and more and more use cases are being discovered, explored, um, you know, every day as more enterprises are embracing RPA. Um, in terms of vertical adoption, uh, based on our ongoing research, the top five verticals for RPA are banking and capital markets, telecom and media, insurance, healthcare and pharma, and CPG and retail. And there were five other verticals. What we have just shown here is the five top verticals. There were five other verticals which had a smaller uh, sort of market share in the overall RP market. So clearly, um, you know, as against the myth uh, that you know it could be applied in only certain industries or verticals, uh, there is a there is a broader adoption of RPA that we are seeing. And the drivers for RPA adoption may be similar across these verticals. Uh, so typically, you know, transaction volume, repeated nature of tasks is, is more common in, let's say, banking and capital markets and telecom and media. Uh, there is a need to build in, build in compliance at lower cost. Within the telecom and media sector, there is pressure to improve quality of service and even lower cost given higher competitive intensity. And overall across, you know, many of these verticals, there is a significant emphasis on moving towards digital and self-service channels. So, so multiple drivers that are leading to adoption of RPA within these industry verticals. Let's also bust the myth around the fact that it can be applied only in certain functions, and I'll let Michael comment on that. Yeah, so we're seeing widespread, on the next slide there, we're seeing widespread adoption across a number of different functions. Uh, certainly, um, you know, you're always going to look for those where they're more uh, labor intensive. And so we do have a number of industry-specific where you see large-scale uh, large adoptions happening early on, claims processing, policy, uh, card activations, fraud, fraud claims, all those things that would be very specific to an industry but have general attributes similar to uh, among them. Um, certainly another area that's very labor-intensive would be the F&A uh, and the contact centers, the next two largest ones. And across the rest of them, you're going to see a scattering opportunity. Now, one of the things that I would I would talk about here also is, you know, this has been, um, you know, there's been lots of different ways of adopting. And if I go back into my history, you know, I've seen large scale adoptions of uh, ERPs. I've seen large scale adoptions of um, 
distributed computing, mobile, e-commerce, things that were cross industry. Uh, and all of those things had the common of those were top down driven. And so those were opportunities that were going to require hundreds of millions of dollars investments, if not more. They were going to require multiple years, two or three years, if not more. They were going to require boardroom level approval. Um, and they were going to require some executive to probably put their name on the line and says, hey, we can make this work. In this, this initiatives around the uh, RPA have, there is a facet that is top down. Uh, and, the, and you're seeing some of that stuff on here, but there's also a facet of it that is uh, very much uh, a grassroots effort. And so people are looking at this on a, on a very uh, um, departmental level, looking at the thing in inc small increments and are looking to, to in, uh, see what differences they can to make a difference uh, process, process in a very small scale. So you have both a top-down and a bottom-up approach, which makes this different than other uh, large-scale initiatives. Okay, Michael, there, there's a question that just came in that I thought would be be interesting just to to ask right now is when we were looking at the previous slide about verticals, uh, manufacturing wasn't in the top five verticals. Do you see is there a barrier to using RPA in manufacturing? Um, not a, no, not really. I mean the the you know it's wherever the labor is going to be, wherever there's process intensiveness. Um, you know, the manufacturing probably have seen more usage or more uh, uh, impact by actual physical robots uh, and other automated processes in the physical world. Uh, uh, this is much more driven towards the services world and where you have larger uh, labor bodies. And so, gotcha. you know, B to C where you have customer contact centers make a big, big play for that uh, or any other, any other services industry. Excellent. Okay. Why don't we move on? To myth number three, and this is one that a lot of people have been asked about. The myth is RPA is only about cost reduction. Well, the reality is the benefits of RPA are wider than just cost reduction, and we saw some of that in the earlier discussion where we talked about impact on cost, operational impact, and sort of business impact. Um, and um, if you move to the next slide, um, beyond cost reduction, our research suggests that there are four core areas where enterprises are having maximum impact from RPA. In fact, we saw the impact on cost was very similar between Pinnacle and other enterprises. Where they really differed was in the operational metric improvement, where Pinnacle enterprises were significantly ahead of other enterprises. Uh, the four core areas are operational improvement, uh, compliance and governance improvement, uh, improvement in employee experience, and improvement in customer experience. Uh, I think there is a lot of focus on the first two uh, in terms of what people are doing and what people are talking about. Uh, the focus on third and fourth also um, is expected to increase going forward. Um, if you see the pinnacle enterprise performance on these four, four benefits, four important benefits, uh, we already talked about operational impact. From a compliance perspective, Pinnacle Enterprises are seeing 39% improvement in SLA compliance uh, in areas where RPA has been applied. From an employee experience improvement perspective, Pinnacle Enterprises are seeing, all Pinnacle Enterprises are seeing happier employees because they've been able to take away some part of their transactional jobs uh, and they have, uh, they're using their time and uh, you know, energy in areas which require judgment call, their experience and their domain knowledge. And finally, from a customer experience standpoint, uh, we saw in the earlier slide, 78% of Pinnacle Enterprises are seeing significant impact uh, as far as improvement in customer experience is concerned. So beyond cost, uh, there are you know, various other areas in which uh, RPA uh, is driving impact. Uh, Michael, would you also want to talk about the case study? Yeah, so, so before, we, before we switch slides there for a second, I, I wanna go back on that employee experience here. And so, you know, as, as indicated, as I was starting to bring into discussion earlier, you know, the service providers and the vendors in this often want to talk about the robots. And the, when we talk to the enterprises, they're often talking about how I, how I can improve the employee experience and the customer experience. And the reason they're doing this, they don't want to scare their employees. They don't want to lose those valuable employees uh, by, hey, there was rumors of the ro robots coming to take your job. Those that actually do a proactive job of of positioning RPA, not as a robotics, and don't even talk about it as RPA, but they talk about improving the employee experience or, or automation, enterprise automation or intelligent automation, 
what they're actually seeing is improvement in their employee retention. So not, not what was initially said, hey, people are going to lose their jobs and that's going to be a bad thing, but they're finding the employees, if it's positioned correctly and there's participation by the employee base on what becomes uh, impacted by RPA uh, or those processes, they're actually happier employers, truly, and they're actually seeing the benefit in retention. So if we move to the next slide here, um, a case study that we are, that we talked with uh, well, one of our clients on, and uh, in this case it's experience, so I think many people know, know, the, know the company. What they were able to do is not position this as RPA at all. What they did is they were actually talking about this in terms of their, their lean Six Sigma program. So they had a culture that allowed them, that already, they already had a culture where they're looking for process, ongoing process improvement. And what they did was to layer in the um, uh, processes and, and some of the techniques that were implied in some of the, the, the software uh, that were provided by in an RPA solution to combine that with lean and see dramatically better results. And so they didn't present it as that RPA result, they just presented this as an augmented version of Lean Six Sigma. And I think that, you know, we heard one or two companies talking about that. I think we're gonna hear a lot more companies uh, talk about this going forward here, where this is not about, um, you know, RPA, but this is really about how do I improve my overall enterprise uh, processes. And if I have a Lean Six Sigma, uh, uh, this is just goes hand in hand with that. Great. Okay, so now let's get into myth number four. And this myth is that RPA can be implemented without the involvement of the IT department. Oh my. <laughs> okay. So uh, most organizations and most uh, you know companies believe that RPA is an operations mandate. Um, and we also believe and agree that RPA typically is led by operations, but we believe RPA programs uh, are more successful um, and they result in better outcomes when they are supported by IT. Uh, so uh, organizations that had more uh, adequate and upfront support of IT are more successful at adopting RPA. And it, it also came out from, the, from, the, from our RPA clinical study. And if you move to the next slide, uh, we saw that clinical enterprises uh, had higher alignment with their IT upfront uh, in the RPA implementation. 90% of clinical enterprises had full support from IT or were jointly implementing IT, you know, uh, with, with jointly implementing RPA with IT support. Whereas in case of other enterprises, only 60% had um, that kind of support from IT. If you see from a, from a risk and security policy alignment perspective, and here we're talking about IT security and risk, all clinical enterprises were able to align and get, you know, IT security and risk uh, team stakeholders on board uh, and uh, create plans for, you know, any 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 breach in IT security and risk, um, you know, upfront. Whereas in case of other enterprises, only 30% of other enterprises did so. So, and and we already know that clinical enterprises are achieving superior outcomes compared to other other enterprises, and this goes uh, as one of the one of one of the important factors, uh, which is uh, driving you know faster adoption, you know uh, limited roadblocks, and really more smoother adoption of RPA in those clinical enterprises. Okay. Um, All right. All right. As we move on to the next slide here. I, what I would add to this is that there's truly a skirmish line being formed here uh, in terms of where IT is participating and not participating and who, who's leading what and, uh, and uh, who, drives, who drives what responsibilities. I think if you were to, you know, the initial reaction I hear, I, I sense from, from IT organizations is they just want to, they want to push this under the covers. Uh, this is a noise, this is a distraction, it's not real IT work you know, at first blush, and, and uh, I think that's an incorrect way of looking at it. I think there's some feeling of, I don't know if the word guilt is the right word, um, but this is a recognition, uh, the whole RPA concept is a recognition that there are deficiencies in the core itself, the core applications of, a, of an enterprise. Um, I think if you ask IT folks, and I, I have talked to them about this, is yes, 
anything that's being done with RPA, we should have been able to do already. Uh, the challenge is the priorities and the ease of doing it, and do they want to touch the core applications, and, and is that a good thing, or is it better to work around uh, some of the core applications that have been around for a long time and don't touch them and just use uh, the RPA concepts uh, to, to get the impact they need to get um, in automation. So I think there's going to be con continued skirmish lines there. I think at the end of the day, we do need IT involved in this. We need IT to take a very proactive role. My fear over the long term on this is that if IT is not bringing the disciplines uh, that they are really good at, uh, they may be a slight ass in some cases to work with because they're not necessarily as fast as you'd like them to be, or they're not they're not as uh, um, sensitive to to speed uh, conversations. Um, but in the end of the day, they do bring some solid disciplines around disaster recovery. They do bring some solid disciplines around process documentation. Um, they are looking at we talk about security and also um, ways of, of looking at this from a disciplined implementation process. And so I think those are uh, extremely important parts. And at, at the end of the day, I think IT will have a much larger hand than it is having today. And it, it, in the long run, it will be a good thing. If it's not done, there are significant risk. If IT does not participate in these, in these uh, security and, and disaster recoveries and things like that, are not brought to bear. There's real risk to the organization as um, vendors come and go in the industry, as uh, processes, are, the, the robots do break, um, as employees that may have originated this, if it was the grassroots uh, departmental level uh, implementation, and those people move on in the business or get promoted, and there's nobody to attend the, the, the process, the broken robots, then you're going to have a real problem. Great. Excellent. And I want to be clear for the record, I didn't break any of the robots, if anyone's keeping track. Um, myth number five, RPA is only suitable for high-volume activities. Okay. The reality is that RPA use cases are found in various types of processes. In fact, um, RP, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, RPA adopters are still discovering use cases. We agree that the impact of RPA is higher on high volume and rule-based processes, which we'll also talk about on the next slide, but really there are use cases emerging in various, uh, across various types of processes, uh, and typically high volume and rule-based processes will give you the maximum impact. We've done some analysis, and if you see on the next slide, uh, let me explain the chart. The, the X axis of the chart talks about the potential extent of automation. So you can think of the, the left side being the judgment-based processes, which are likely to have low volume, and a right side being rule-based or transactional processes. And the Y axis is the potential cost savings. And as we have done this analysis, we have sort of kept all the other factors constant to just really understand, based on the extent of automation, how can the savings potential change? And what you see here is even for processes which do not have very high potential of automation, maybe you know 10 to 30 uh, percent is the real extent of automation. There are savings to the tune of six to 20 percent. Uh, and if you could uh, free up <clears throat> your employees' time from some of these processes and use them in, in you know somewhere else, I think the overall benefit uh, will be even higher. We're just talking here about the cost saving benefit. Of course, for processes where the extent of automation is higher, you know, plus 50% or plus 60%, uh, the potential cost savings increase to, to about 30, 40%, which we also saw, you know, in the earlier analysis. Okay. So, the, so the, the possibilities here definitely go beyond uh, transactional activities. Uh, um, in, in some of the things were, uh, that we were talking to clients and some of the use cases they were, they were, they were implementing, um, you know, it wasn't about eliminating work. It was actually about creating new work and creating new value within the, the, the value chain or their, their customer base. And so one of the examples I remember uh, talking to a bank who was able to uh, create new, they were, they were dealing with mid-sized and large companies and they were able to do some analytics for them. And uh, their smaller clients, they were not able to do because the labor, the labor cost of creating those analytics uh, was not justifiable for the revenue stream. So when they were able to deploy RPA techniques, um, they were able to take the same, the very same uh, analytic processes for their medium and large clients down to their small and, and ultra small clients. And so in that case, it 
wasn't a cost takeout in, in, uh, in any sense. It was actually a uh, slight increase to expense, but to get high value in a segment that was previously not as um, well, well served. And so what they're looking at this is was an opportunity to improve the overall customer experience and uh, with the intent to either become a, have a competitive advantage uh, in the marketplace by giving better service or uh, at least retain the current client base they have right now. So it's kind of hard to measure exactly what the value was when they, when they were talking about this. Uh, but they certainly looked at it as, hey, we're doing something that goes well beyond just pure transactional labor takeout on uh, improving the value chain. The same could be said back in those employee experiences. You know, how do I get rid of 20% of, of the work that an employee does in the, you know, the middle layers of the pyramid, the labor pyramid? How do I get 20% of the work? And if I can free up five, 10 hours out of a small department of 10 people, that's an FTE. And, and that may be just the amount of uh, productivity improvements that I need to make my sales numbers this year or improve my, my, my outputs by, you know, five or 10%. And if I can't make hires, I can still I can go grow or get to, get to my, my, new and per, my new and higher objectives as we all see year over year. Excellent. Okay, so we hope uh, by dispelling these myths, we've kind of created some clarity for everyone here. Let's talk, let's go and talk about our, our last section before the Q&A. And that's really just great. We've talked all about this. What does it really mean in terms of the implications for enterprises? So, Michael, could you uh, share with us some of your thoughts there? Yeah, so we're a little pressed for time. I'm just going to hit a couple of these things, uh, the statements here. The, obviously, we believe the benefits of RPA are very real. Um, it's still early, early days, but there is no doubt there is going to be both cost takeout, primarily through labor savings, um, and probably more importantly in my mind is operational improvement. So if I was to, to, to evaluate it, what's the bigger impact of uh, – taking the cost down by 30% or improving my operational accuracy and other things, I actually think the operational improvements are a bigger overall impact to the organization uh, than the actual cost they take out. So if I can improve my accuracy, there's a lot of downstream measures, or uh, impact, downstream improvements and impacts by not having to do rework or improving cycle time or improving the overall customer experience. So I think it's, it's real in any way you want to measure it. Um, but it's still early days, and I think we're going to continue to see uh, no doubt about that. Jobs being a way overblown, you know, I think this is an opportunity uh, uh, to, to solve a problem we're going to have in the U.S. and Europe uh, with the regards to not being able to hire um, all the people we want to hire. Uh, with unemployment being at record lows, you know, we have no choice but to, to look at what we can do more with, with less or more with the same number of people we have. Um, you know, we've already talked about the employee and customer experience. Um, talk a little bit about the top down versus uh, bottom up grassroots. And so I think there will be both. I think it's a mistake to look at this as only like we've done some of the legacy big, big opportunities um, as a top down process. I think this will, the more you include it, be inclusive, uh, the more you're going to find. And so I think, you know, take, take it from both directions and let the, let the big uh, investments come from the top, even though they're going to be and much, much less than, than some of the previous historical uh, opportunities in terms of the overall capital X. I mean, the opportunities could actually be big without the CapEx. Um, but then there's still going to be a lot of small things that are going to be driven at a grassroots rate level that are important. And um, uh, I'll just pick on the last one there. Uh, IT definitely needs to be an end-to-end uh, an, 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 an partner here. And uh, I believe over the long term, a good IT participation and, and partnership will be the key to success. And I do and without it, I do believe we're going to hear some nasty stories down the road of people that have put processes in that were mission critical for their business operations. They they got it going. And all things were going well. They broke, and nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew how to fix it. And those are the key studies that stick out a few years from now, or a few months, from, a few quarters from now. And we want to avoid those. Excellent. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for that, Michael and Sakshi. Um, what I want to do now before we go to Q&A is 
share with you a couple of things. We get asked all the time of, that was great, that was, you know, an hour of content, we really like this, but um, we want more. We, we want to have, we have more questions. So, first of all, let me point out that in the next, within the next 48 uh, hours, business hours, we will have a copy of this, these slides and a recording of this sent out to everyone who has registered for the webinar. So we get that question a lot. Want to let you know you will receive that in the next two business days. But what you see on the screen right now are areas that we continually to help our clients um, moving forward. Now, one thing I'll point out here, if you look under content and interaction, at the beginning of today's webinar, Michael and Sakshi shared with you all our Pinnacle model um, study for RPA. We are doing a number of Pinnacle studies in different areas. If you have any interest in participating in a future Pinnacle model study, uh, we would love to have your participation. And we're going to share on the last screen during the Q&A uh, some emails where you can reach out to us and we can get you in touch with the right people so you'd be able to participate. It's not um, that laborious uh, a, a process. It's really 20 to 25 minute um, uh, set of questions. The other areas you can see from our memberships where we help enterprises and other organizations improve their processes within the sourcing market. And then you could see on the right side under decision support and advisory, these are key areas and key broad topic areas that we are working with our client base on. So with that said, let's go to our Q&A time. Now I know a number of people have been sharing questions online and Amar has been uh, diligently answering them, but we do have a number of questions that people have. So what we want to do is let's go to the, the last slide and let me point out a couple of housekeeping things. If you have a question in the right, right hand side of your screen, it'll open up the Q&A. Please feel free to send this uh, a question, send it to all the panelists, and then we will respond. Uh, we may not have enough time for every question, but we will do our best. Also, after that, you can see below, you can contact either myself, Michael, or Sakshi, or just click the Contact Us link there as well, and we will be able to uh, respond with any additional questions. So now, starting with that, why don't we start to see um, what, what we, uh, some of our questions, and I'm going to kick it off with saying, um, this question comes from Tim. It says, there seems to be a perception that robot development is something that any tech-savvy business team member can do. They're not finding that to the case. What are you seeing, Michael and, and Sakshi? Yeah, so let me, let me hit that one right up. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's easy to kind of visualize how it could be done by, you know, a staff accountant or a staff you know, some kind of business analyst. I think in the reality is, and this is what I was referring to, is that IT is going to be absolutely vital in the in the participation process. I think having some of the, as you referred to in your quest, your comment there, uh, some knowledge of coding is going to be um, helpful in in structured discipline processes uh, around making this happen, um, and 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 having it fit into your overall, uh, uh, you know policies of the organization around security, disaster recovery, uh, implementation, and, and, uh, and how things work in general and from an IT perspective, I think that's going to be crit crucial. Yeah. I do think that the business operations are going to lead itself. Yeah. Plus, Michael, um, you know, as enterprise, uh, you know, uh, applications or user interface may undergo some change, uh, there is more uh, skill needed than just, you know, um, fine-tuning the bot to work on a particular application. So uh, a combination of tech and business skills are needed to make the robots work. And just having some tech-savvy, you know, operations team member, you know, uh, fine-tune the bots will not be a, will not be, will not work and will not be the right strategy. Yeah. And I think, you know, just from, you know, I think there's been a, an initial uh, excitement by the 
the biz ops and initial reluctance by IT. But I can just tell you, even in just um, in the time we've been talking about this over the last uh, couple quarters here, in the context of the study and the, some of the interviews we did, we saw more and more participation by IT. So I think there was that initial uh, view of this, and I think the long-term view. And, and I've had many conversations with IT organizations that they're very, you know, almost becoming hyper aware of, you know, needing to catch up. And some of those COEs that are going to be developing are going to report into IT. Great. It's going to still be on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but it's not, it's not going to, it's not going to be, be, you know, led by the accounting department exclusively down there. Excellent. Okay. I want to go back to a question. This question comes from Vikram, and uh, Vikram is this question sent around, centers around our first myth, which is that robots will replace humans. And it's a, it's a two-part question. So the, the first question is, how come at this point are we still not able to predict as to what percentage of jobs will definitely be lost? And then as a follow-up to that is, do you think that in five to seven years that myth still will be dispelled and it will not have changed in that time frame? Yeah, so let me let me take the first crack at that and so I'll let you follow up on it. So right now enterprises, because they're still largely in the uh, early days and they're still doing a lot of pilots, um, the, 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 where this is being implemented is in that mostly in the middle layer small-scale adoption, and parts of, portions of people are being uh, impacted. We do expect this to have, in the, in the transactional layer at the bottom of the labor pyramid, we do expect to see real job losses there. And they're not being reported right now, but I expect them to be real. Let me give you one indication that you can kind of see it, uh, though we weren't able to measure or study. If you look at the overall number of employees in the top Indian heritage firms, Okay, those firms that uh, have been the biggest beneficiary of labor arbitrage, moving things to low-cost locations, primarily in the other, other locations around the world, um, they've actually, while they're still growing their top line, for the first time in 2017, we saw them as a group as a whole actually have reduced staff, count, staff uh, head, head counts. So their overall staffing levels are actually down uh, in, in, the, in the current environment. We expect, we expect that to accelerate. Uh, and the impact will be seen largely in, in, uh, in some of the work that we moved to India. You know, kind of some of it was your mess for less. Well, now that your mess for less uh, value proposition gets translated to improved quality at, at, with less labor. Great. Yep. Okay. Um, here's a, a broad, a broad uh, question. Um, that really, I think, kind of is a follow-on to that is, do you see the opportunity that this will bring jobs onshore? I'm going to take a stab at that again. I don't see that. I think it's going to be kind of like we talked about manufacturing. Um, there may be an impact to Andy, but I do not see a big movement to bringing back jobs onshore, just like we didn't see in the manufacturing. So I know we have an illustrious president talked about uh, bringing jobs back on shore. He may be bringing the work back on, but coming back in largely automated processes. There will be some specialists that uh, find new roles in, in the helping of the implementation of RPA, but in a large scale in, in adoption, I still don't see it happening. This okay. is, you know, I, I, I've heard these things for dec you know, for well over a decade, hey, we're gonna bring the work back on shore. And then every time everybody does the, the cost benefit analysis, uh, you know, it doesn't happen. So yeah. I think that the difference will happen yeah. in the low-cost locations, but not not to bring the work back. Yeah. To to add to what Michael just said, uh, some work and some processes may come back onshore, and they ultimately end up getting automated, which means effectively only few jobs will be created. Uh, those needed to run and manage those automations. Uh, the other aspect of this is since a uh, lot of transactional work, you know, high-volume work has already been moved offshore. The process expertise. Uh, you know, uh, is also residing in offshore locations to a significant extent, and that makes a stronger case for implementing automation in in, in those locations where you already have the end-to-end -end process visibility as well as um, you know systems that are needed to run that process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Well, you mentioned something. We've got another question here from uh, Javed where how does, how does an organization do a cost-benefit analysis before they invest in RPA? Because sometimes the fear is that the cost is a lot more than the benefit it's going to provide. So, uh, so Michael, let me take it up. So, uh, cost-benefit analysis obviously definitely definitely needs to be done, and organizations are doing it not just at the overall program level, but really at a process level before they are taking up any process for automation. So, we saw examples where, if, you know, as they were automating, they were deciding to automate processes. Uh, for each process, um, if, if the process does not meet a specified threshold, you know, in terms of providing the benefit, they wouldn't really consider that process for automation. So that's, that's, that's the general philosophy we saw in the market. In terms of how they are doing it, uh, again, more evolved org organizations are looking at cost benefit, even operational benefit, benefit in quantifying the dollar uplift that is being generated from the operational benefit. And some even more, uh, you know, evolved cases that we saw is that um, even the impact of business or strategic areas like customer experience improvement, they're attempting to even quantify that. So different variations, but really evolved model is to at least quantify cost and operational improvement, if not the business impact. Great. Okay. So uh, I want to thank everyone. I know we, we have a lot more questions, but it's very important to us to end on time. We know everyone has very busy schedules. Once again, if you have any further questions, would like to get in touch and learn more, uh, please reach out to us, and we'll be more than happy to set up time to discuss with you. We hope this is worthwhile. We hope you will uh, join us for our next webinar. And with that said, thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful day and a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.